Great pleasure Perfect. having uh, Robert Schulz here. He's an engineering manager at ClickHouse, which is one of this distributed uh, database system. And it has a ClickHouse benchmark, which is really popular in the database world. And it's a fascinating new system. And he's going to tell us about that. Robert, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, yeah, my name is Robert. I work on the ClickHouse database at ClickHouse Inc. And I wanted to take the chance and give you a, a super high level intro to ClickHouse. So what is, what is ClickHouse? Um, ClickHouse is an open source, column-oriented, distributed OLAP database. Development started 16 years ago at Yandex, and about 10 years ago, the code was open source. Today, ClickHouse is hugely popular, and there are more than 2,000 contributors on GitHub. The code in, is written in C++, and the database runs on pretty much anything from a Raspberry Pi to powerful servers. Now, being a column store, People typically use ClickHouse to filter and aggregate billions and trillions of rows. The storage layer is optimized for appends, which basically means that inserts are super fast and updates and deletes, they still work, but they tend to be uh, a little bit slower. And this might sound <clears throat> perhaps uh, strange, but there are actually lots of use cases where the data is continuously added, but rarely or never modified. And these use cases are typically around events, logs, and traces. Let me also mention that you can build a cluster of ClickHouse nodes and replicate and shard your data. Now, if you do that, the database will be only eventually consistent. That's an interesting topic in itself, but in the interest of time, I'll not talk about this today. So what I will focus on today is the storage layer, data pruning, and query execution. But let's first have a look at the architecture of ClickHouse. There's a lot of stuff on the slide, um, but the, the two important parts are in pink, the query processing layer, and in blue, the storage layer. You can see that the query processing layer follows this traditional paradigm of parsing uh, the incoming SQL query, building and optimizing a logical plan, building and optimizing a physical plan, and finally executing it. The storage layer has this uh, concept of pluggable table engines, which each represent the location and the format of the table data. MySQL has a similar abstraction and uh, we actually stole that idea from them. <laughs> so I'll, I'll only talk about the so-called merge tree table engine, which is the um, native ta table engine of ClickHouse. <clears throat> and this slide shows the merge tree table engine in more detail. What happens if you insert a bunch of rows into a table is that the new rows are sorted by the primary key columns and then stored as a, as a sorted string table. And we called it internally part. Once written, a part cannot be changed anymore. Or in other words, it's immutable. We actually encourage our users to insert the data in batches, for instance, 20,000 rows at once to avoid that too many, too little parts are created. And to prevent the parts from accumulating on disk, there is a background compaction job which continuously combines them into bigger parts. Now remember the parts are sorted each. This means the merge can use a K-way merge sort algorithm to combine parts and that's, um, that's relatively cheap. Of course, that doesn't solve the problem of write amplification. <clears throat> and the way we handle this is that we simply stop merging parts once they reach a certain size. By default, that's 150 gigabyte. Um, there's also an asynchronous insert mode, which basically buffers the rows of multiple inserts before the part is flushed to disk. Um, again, it's interesting, I'll not talk about this today. You may notice that all of this is very similar to a classical LSM tree. The major difference is that the parts in ClickHouse are all equal, so they are not organized in a, in a hierarchy. This has advantages, this has disadvantages. On the one hand, the merge can freely pick which parts it combines. So we are not bound to a, to a certain LSM tree level. On the other hand, updates and deletes become more tricky. So we cannot use tombstones, but for our use case, that's fine, as we don't expect to have lots of updates and, delete and deletes anyways. Okay, so ClickHouse has this reputation for being uh, fast and uh, the main ingredient to performance is super aggressive data pruning. The idea is that you want your select queries to skip as much data as possible because every byte that you don't read and don't process helps with performance. And there are really three major data pruning techniques in ClickHouse. The first one are primary key indexes. I mentioned that every part is sorted by a set of sorting columns that we call primary key columns. ClickHouse will 
additionally create an index structure on top of the primary key columns, and that index maps from the primary key column values, values to offsets within the part that contain these values. So if you have a query that filters on a prefix of the primary key columns, ClickHouse will use the primary key index to jump to the right offset directly, and it will not scan the entire thing. Second pruning technique in ClickHouse are projections. So you can think of a projection as an alternative version of a table. A projection contains the same rows as the original table, but it's sorted by a different primary key. So if you have lots of queries which filter on columns different than the original primary key columns, you want to create a projection. Projections can speed up queries by a lot, but um, their main downside is that they increase the storage footprint of the data also. And that brings me to the third pruning technique in ClickHouse, which are skipping indexes. And the idea here is to annotate blocks of data within the parts with metadata. The scan can now check if no rows or all the rows in a block will match the predicate, and it can possibly skip the scan of the block. And there are now different um, types of skipping indexes in ClickHouse, for instance, zone maps, um, the unique block values, and blue filters. Every type has different trade-offs, of course, but generally speaking, skipping indexes are, are a lot more lightweight than projections, but they're also hard to tune as they make assumptions about the data distribution. Okay, and um, I will finish with a, a couple of words about query execution in ClickHouse. Like every modern database, ClickHouse will try to utilize all server and cluster resources. To use all CPU cores, we unfold the physical execution plan into n lanes. So in the example on the right, n is three, the system has three cores. Every lane processes a disjoint range of the source data, or in other words, ClickHouse splits the source table into three equally large ranges. Of course, in practice, things don't always go smoothly, and you could potentially end up with imbalanced lanes if the, if the selectivities of the data ranges differs quite a lot from each other. Now, if you do nothing, your course will basically become underutilized. So what we do here is that we insert um, exchange operators in certain places into the plan. The operators themselves pass multiple tuples at a time instead of single tuples. Or to put it, or say it a bit more fancy, ClickHouse uses the vectorized volcano model, which has a pretty good cache locality and which also amortizes for the cost of virtual function calls. There's actually a lot more to say about ClickHouse, um, of course, but I hope you now have a rough idea of what the database is about. And that's, that's it basically from my side today. If you'd like to know more, uh, feel free to check our GitHub repository. And there's also a research paper that we, did, that we published last year at the VLDB conference. Thanks, everyone. Questions? I have a question, Robert. Uh, could we expand a little bit on the difference of the NSN trees? Of course, you don't have the field hierarchy, but uh, does that mean you have to keep something else so that you can be with duplicates or outdated keys uh, uh, that we go to the uh, arts uh, tables? Uh, the audio is, is not great. I maybe say again, please. <laughs> Sorry, is this better? Much better. Okay, great. So the question I had is, could you expand a little bit on the differences between LSM trees and what you have and how you might deal with outdated tuples when you start doing a scan? Right. Yeah, th that's an excellent question. Um, so we, I mean, the, the expectation generally is that updates and deletes are rare and that they, you know, but still in some, in some use cases, you have to, to change existing data. For instance, in Europe, there's the GDPR, right? Where you need to delete customer data, for instance. Um, the, the way we do that is that we rewrite, uh, yeah. we rewrite the existing parts, but that's a super expensive operation, um, it, which can take hours or sometimes even days. And there's another approach where you don't need to change the data physically. Um, so to, you can also mask out certain rows. So there's, there's like a bit mask that- um, Got it. Yeah. Okay, 
That makes sense. I was assuming there was something going to the, some mask of some sort. That makes sense. Okay, yeah. wonderful. Uh, the last question is: Do you guys think about uh, joins and stuff like that? I know in the streaming environment, you really don't need that, but is that something on the horizon? Yeah, we do definitely. Um, our use cases historically involved denormalized tables, but we are looking at joins and you know optimizing them as well. Yeah. Great. Wonderful. Sounds good. Look forward to hearing uh, from you about all of those changes as, as you come and visit us again the next semester. So thank you, Robert.